Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another week and another set of mediocre hockey games for the Calgary Flames, I guess is the best way to say this. Um, uh, As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, we had so much hope after that Arizona game. Well, it's one of those things where, um, frankly, the goaltending has let this team down and this team's not going to make the playoffs if Markstrom and Vladar are in net. So it it is what it is. You Calgary is one of the best teams at uh, suppressing shots. Um, We're actually second behind only Carolina, and I was reading a stat where, like, they're getting, like, a 908 save percentage between the the three goalies that they use, which is not even very good, and yet they're first in their division and the second-best team in the NHL just because they're getting good enough goaltending. And, you know, Calgary's uh, save percentage is, like, 30 points lower than that. And, uh, you know, not at an NHL level. And, frankly, with the pair of them, uh, with how they're performing, I don't really want to see either one of them back next season. Calgary Flames goaltenders currently own an NHL worst 847 save percent since the All-Star break. But let's uh, jump in and talk about how they fared this week. Uh, On Family Day, the Calgary Flames played a... Uh, a matinee game against the Philadelphia Flyers, a game that otherwise I don't think anyone would care for if it wasn't for all the families that wanted to go check it out. And uh, the Calgary Flames dropped this one 4-3 to the Flyers in regulation. We had Flames goals here from Backland to Foley and Mangiapane. Yep. Uh, this is a game where the Flames played well enough where they should have got two points. Uh, the players, that is. And the goalies stole vic- uh, loss out of what should have been an easy win, and uh, like the the goaltending just let them down. Uh, they're the goalies are playing way too deep in their net on most of the goals against. Um, the fourth goal arguably could have been uh, goaltender interference, possible coach's challenge, but you know. Um, it's just one of those things where like it's a re- going to be a repetitive story especially this week where the team's playing all right and doing all the things that they need to where they should have won all four games this week and yet the goaltending and yet the goaltending well in that game <laughs> Jacob Markstrom was in net um, the next yeah. game of the week the Calgary Flames made their mullet arena debut which is something I don't think anyone was looking forward to, but the Calgary Flames go to play in Arizona to the less than 5,000 people that can be there. And uh, this time, the Calgary Flames had Dan Vladar in net for a big 6-3 to three Flames win. Yeah. Five and, unanswered goals. Uh, you know, yeah, and the fact is is that like the Flames were out shooting the Coyotes at one point 30-8 and yet were trailing 3-1. to one. Again, like even though the Flames' offense managed to put the Coyotes away because the Coyotes are terrible, they should not have been down three to one at that point. And like the first goal uh, that uh, was scored, uh, Ladar was too deep in his net on the pass across, and that's why there was a lane for the shot to go in. And on the breakaway goal, or the two-on-one that became a two-on-two, Vladar was not out far enough. And it seems to be a systemic problem with the goaltending coaches where the Flames, both the goaltenders are big goalies who are the blocking style of goaltender. And they take up a big part of the net. And, you know, if you're playing the angles properly... You know, like if Ladar on that 3 1 goal had been out like eight or nine inches further from, like, because he was right at the border of the blue ice and white ice, if he was out like eight, nine inches or a little bit more, there is literally no shot that the goal guy that scored could have taken on Ladar to actually put the puck in. But because he's further back, he's playing like he's a six foot tall goaltender playing the blocking style and there's holes here and there and you know it it makes 
everybody's job more difficult when you're allowing very stoppable pucks from going in. And it's not just Vladar, it's Markstrom too, where they're both too deep in the net. And pucks that should just be routine, you know, blow the whistle for a face-off type shots, like that you see 15, 20 times a game, like a bunch of them are going in needlessly. Well, let's come back to, yeah, the sort of the goaltending woes and what might be going on there because I, I think that there's a, a bigger discussion, one we've had, but we can definitely have again. Um, but let's... Yeah. let's And it, yeah, and it was encouraging that the Flames, once they went down 3-1, woke up and said, well, you know, <laughs> we're just going to have to outscore our problems at this point and we're able to just translate that into running over the Coyotes. For the week that, that we've had, this was, I would say, the game that was fun to watch as a Flames fan. The one and yeah. only. Yeah. And then... Well, the first, the honestly, the first two periods of the Vegas game were also very enjoyable. <laughs> and then the goaltending. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fair to say. Well, the Vegas game you're just referencing was the night after. This was Thursday night, so less than 24 hours after uh, playing the the uh, Coyotes, they played the Golden Knights, who were wearing their actual golden jerseys, which I'm still not sure what I think of. Um, and. I, I both like and hate them, and I, I almost want to see them play an exhibition game against their farm team, where they wear their silver jerseys like that, and you know, really make everything. We can awful. talk about this idea another time, but I've always thought for teams like Calgary and Vegas, where the farm team is in the same city or close by, it'd be a neat thing to do after training camp to have the NHL versus the AHL. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll talk. We'll talk about yeah. it on the, on a week when we're done complaining about the goaltending um yeah this was a game where the calgary flames started hot they got uh peltier's third goal huberto's 11th to get up to nothing and then um i would say like you did after the second period the game slipped away from them in the third and calgary ended up with a uh overtime loss here uh four to three yeah and it, just bad positioning by the goaltenders once again uh, marks from in this one uh, where he just lost his the uh, positioning on that I, I think it was Markstrom yeah Vegas uh, was Markstrom but okay uh, just making sure I was remembering I'm double correctly. checking now uh, I'm, I have my notes it is but I'm <laughs> double checking the, the box score yeah yeah it, no it was Vladar uh, in this one Okay, it was Vladar then uh, that uh, positionally, like on the 3 2 goal, uh, which was basically the backbreaker for the team, the pa- the player had the puck on the end sideboards and he passed it out to the slightly adjacent from where he was. Vladar did not react well by challenging the shooter at all, and he left like the entire side of the net open. And it's one of those where, like, it's kind of goaltending 101 where if you have a pass out, you kind of shoot out towards the guy that to cut off his angle for the shot. And instead, he kind of just turned towards the, the shooter and then just waved at the puck as it went by. And I don't understand the philosophy of the Flames goalie coaches where, like, the guys are just playing so deep in their net that like even like because that's a fairly routine shot that white cloud scored on and yet the goaltender was well out of position and like it just it's baffling because like none of the other teams that have reasonable goaltending have these kind of issues where you know because they do like the goalie 101 things effectively. And I mean, every goalie and gets caught out of position once in a while, but I think for the Flames, it's just becoming a comedy of errors it, now. Yeah, like it's basically every game, and, you know, it's hard to remember which one's Markstrom and which one's Vladar at this point because they're both doing the exact same things, and it's causing the same problems where, you know, it, it's just frustrating because, like, the, again, like this game should have been an easy 3 to 1 Flames win against the Knights, or maybe 4-1 to one with an empty netter. 
but that backbreaking goal gave the Knights uh, all the momentum, and by that time, Calgary didn't have any ability to stop the momentum. Well, yeah. Hockey Night in Canada was Saturday night, and this was the score you just predicted, but the opposite way around. This is a 4-1 to one game, but 4-1 for to one for the Avalanche. The uh, Avalanche, at least on the scoreboard, ran over the Flames in this one. What did you think of the game on the ice? Well, I thought the Flames were really great for the first two shifts, and then Markstrom happened. Uh, two goals, two shots, and that basically shot the Flames for the rest of the night. Yeah, and that's a... F- I think that's a fair assessment. It's hard, you know, like it's hard as a player, like, it, you know, when you're pouring it on, at, you know, to start, you got a really good start, and literally the first two shots, you're already down 2 nothing. It's very difficult to come back from two goals against any team in the NHL. And so, like, eight, six minutes in or whatever it was, like, the game's already over, and... Like, I'm sure the players themselves are getting frustrated because, like, they're doing all the right things. And, like, realistically, if it wasn't for inept goaltending this week, the Flames should have rifled off four wins. And it, it's tough because, like, the Flames are in a playoff race. It, you can see that the forward group is buckling down and actually playing effectively all four lines. The 18 guys who aren't wearing goalie pads look, and I would say since probably January, have looked like they were starting to get it together. Yeah, like this team looks like it could be dangerous, but the goaltending just continually shoots this team in the foot. So, and I don't normally go out of my way to blame a specific player or players. It, it's just like, this is like next level bad. And I mean, this this week especially, it was noticeable. It was both goalies. It was all week. I know I've brought up to you in the past, you know, is it Siglet and Barbera who are sort of our goaltending coaching team? Is it just these two guys? Like, I, and I don't know we're ever going to have that answer. But when I look at the time since, and, and I've mentioned this in the show before, since Siglet has been here, I'd say there's more goalies that have come to Calgary and regressed or not looked good than guys that have come to Calgary and looked good. Well, pretty much, like, the only guy who's had sustained success while being here is Kari Ramo, and that's it. Like, everybody else... Yeah, I would even say probably David Riddick. Uh, he regressed quite a bit at the end, though. Like, he was okay. He he got good, was an all-star, and then, like, burnt out, like, right away. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends if we're looking at, you know, based on where he was, where he wasn't even drafted to there. Yeah, I can see where you're going. Yeah, it, it's tough, though, because, you know, like, you look at Markstrom, he's not a bad goalie. And I can even see, like, when he's playing, that most of the time he's doing the right things, but he's on the wrong position in the ice to do the thing that he's trying to do effectively. And... You know, it it literally, like, with the, most of the Flames' goals against, it comes down to the goalies just being in a really bad position on the ice to make the save. And that's a, one of, like, the most easily correctable things. And yet, like, the team just doesn't seem to make any adaptation or the players themselves because, like, I, I just personally don't get it like frankly like you know you'd be looking at tape and amongst the other team's goalies even that you're facing and you can see the difference like the goaltenders for the flames are usually about a foot closer to the net than the opposition goalies are on the same plays and it's like that's literally the difference and like that's why like the flames are firing shot after shot and the goalies are making saves because they're actually cutting it off, the angles and that, and squaring up the shooters properly. And our guys aren't doing that. And, you know, to me, it, it looks a lot like, a co- I don't want to say it's the goalie coaches, but it looks like our goalies, especially Markstrom, is being asked to go against his instincts. It looks like he's trying to make the decision that he feels is right, and then almost, you know, as he's making that decision, it almost looks like he's changing his mind, and that's when he runs into trouble. Yeah, and, like, it, it's just so discombobulated that, like, it, like frankly, like, the Flames goaltending performance, this is, like, Jonas Hiller in 2015-2016 level bad, 
where you know like that basically like career ending level bad performances by both of these guys frankly and you know neither one of these guys are this bad and like especially with the flames defense in front of them like they're the second best team at suppressing shots and like it's all the mid danger chances that like the flames rank 31 first in the nhl amongst mid danger shots which are like the semi tough but not really saves that you know like good goalies make the, them look kind of routine and yet like the flames save percentage on them is like 830 or some you know ridiculously low percentage and like that's also the highest amount of chances that the flames goalies face you know like it, that's the frustrating part because like those are frankly like routine saves that like every goalie should make and yet you know like it's just bad and you know while like, the while the goalies both look bad this you know this week especially i think that you and i have talked a lot about dan Vlar's growth this year and we all go through bad stretches I'm starting to think that Vladar just happens to be catching a cold stretch at the worst time possible because yeah. he has looked pretty good all year, but it's just it's adding insult to injury. Yeah, and it's one of those where, you know, like if the Flames, frankly, are wanting to actually vie for a playoff spot, I think you have to call Dust David Wolf up uh, because Dustin Wolf. But, yeah. I forgot. David McBain. Wolf was the the European prospect. It looked like Wolf Castle McBain. Yes, I always get them confused. But uh, both D Wolf he, names. He, he'd be worse in goal. Yeah. Well, he just blocked the whole thing because he's McBain. <laughs> but no, uh, it, it's one of those where, with Wolf playing so spectacularly in the Flames farm system, he's the best goalie in the AHL by a wide margin he's the same age that Matt Murray was when the Penguins recalled him heading into the postseason that year like there's no real reason to keep him down other than the other two guys are ahead of him but with how just god awful the the two goaltenders have been this last bit and the fact that you know like there's only 20 games left and you know the flames are outside of a playoff spot like if you're wanting a legit chance you have to go with somebody who actually seems to know how to stop a puck at this point so like you said the flames are outside of a playoff spot right now they are third in the wild card race they've played 60 games 27 wins 21 losses and 12 overtime losses for a total of 66 points seattle is number one in the wild card at 70 points Winnipeg 71, and then Edmonton is last in the Pacific at 72. So we are significantly down. We're four points down from a wild card spot. I guess, Matt, when I look at that, okay, I know what you're saying about Wolf, and I know what you're saying about Matt Murray, and I'm not discounting that. I, I don't think Matt Murray becomes the template. I think Murray is the exception rather than the rule. Is this season still savable, though? Yeah. I look at the play of the guys that are in front of him, and, like, it would be different if the Flames played, like, garbage in front of the goaltenders and they lost three out of the four. But, frankly, they could have won at least three, if not all four of the games this week, if not for the goaltending. And, it, to me, it's one of those where if you replace the historically bad goaltending that we've been getting with just adequate goaltending... Like, all of a sudden, this team goes on a huge winning streak. And, you know, uh, as tough as it is to throw the two guys under the bus, you know, this is crunch time in the season. Unless the team wants to basically start tearing the team down and apart and selling off pieces and, you know, going into, a, like, a full tear-down rebuild, you know, like, there is literally no sense at playing Markstrom or Vladar for the rest of you know, because uh, they're they've been showing over the last months that neither one of them, since basically January, Vladar has been bad, and Marks from all year has been bad. Like uh, there's no more need for sample size. Like it, it's, you know, the results are in. They're bad, and you know, it, 
at this point, like uh, the other day, I saw Chris Dreger on waivers uh, from Seattle, and it's like, hmm, tempting. <laughs> you know? I saw that too. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> you know, because like at this point, it's like, is James Reimer available or, you know, insert miscellaneous okay guy here? Where's Louis Domingue right now? You know, because at least, you know, even if you got mediocre goaltending, that, that's like a light year's improvement for this team. And like, and that's not to say that Markstrom doesn't bounce back next year, but that definitely needs to be on another team. Um, and Vladar, you know, whether this is just a cold snap or something's messed up, I don't know. But like, they just need, especially over so the you, next few so weeks. So your thought at this point is it's time to move on from both guys. Uh, at least Markstrom, for sure, because six million dollars. Yeah, you you need to allocate that somewhere else. Even if you're getting the exact same level of contract back, just change of scenery at best, you know. Like, how would you say? Like, it's like how I've mentioned in the past, like, uh, trading him for, like, Cal Peterson from L.A. That level yeah. of, you know, mediocre for mediocre and see if just the change of scenery will do the job. But... You know, it's, yeah, like I said, I, I think that overall Vladar has actually shown strides this year. I think yeah, he's I looking agree. bad right now, but I think he at least deserves... If you're going to move on from one of them, I think Vladar deserves another year. Yeah, I agree. And he just signed an extension as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm not in any rush to get rid of Vladar, because even if this is what he is, that's still a capable backup, which that's fine. Uh, but like this play from Markstrom is just this is actually like so bad that this guy cannot be in the organization next year. level bad like they need to move on from him just sort of like James Neal that one year he was here like that was just so bad and disruptive that just any other contract will be better <laughs> and I think at that point okay so if you do if you do decide that's right and I'm not convinced that's what the flames are going to do but I think if you do do that, you've got to also look at what happened. And again, maybe there needs to be a change with goaltending coaches. Maybe oh, something else needs to change. But I think you can't just move the guy and say, okay, we're good. Especially like you and I mentioned, almost every goalie that's been here during the Siglet era has gone down in you know talent level or um, you know significantly regressed. So I think we need to look at how we're handling our goalies. Oh, I and agree. That's my, and that's my only concern with bringing... Uh, Dustin Wolf up is does he fall victim to the same thing? Yeah, and that is a concern as well. But it's also one of those where because Wolf has been so good doing what he's doing that it's a little harder to mess up in such a short period of time <laughs> at the pro level because you know that it's. But I think it depends if they let him do his thing or if they start saying, you're going to play this way. Well, then the Flames need to fire the coaches immediately, <laughs> frankly. And I don't know if that's what's happening, but no. it just... It, 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 it's one of those that, because, like, Wolf has shown over the two years in the AHL that, like, he's an elite player at that level and all through juniors, that, you know, you kind of have to defer to the guy who's putting up those numbers instead of necessarily the coach you know if there's a different coaching philosophy because you know it, and you said something about Marstrom well. I mean a guy who was probably in the running for Vesna last year it, you know for most of the year I think you know something obviously happened between then and now yeah and I it's just a starting a lack of confidence and I don't understand exactly like it, the symptom is that the positioning is bad for both goalies but you know, like, what uh, is the cause of that? Yeah, that's the visible symptom. But why, and and why has Markstrom, my big question is, why has Markstrom regressed so much from Vesna to where he is now? It's not like it's been a slow, hey, this guy's getting older and he's slowly slowing down. There's been a big change from being Vesna caliber last year to now being... The worst goalie in the NHL, frankly. Yeah. Like, to put it bluntly, like... And it's frustrating because... Like the Flames are doing an excellent job at limiting the shots against, limiting the ch chances against. Uh, like the 
Flames are literally second in the NHL in shot suppression, and like they're not even allowing a lot of high danger chances. It's all the mid range ones that are difficult ish, but not overly difficult saves that are kind of like the routine saves that Kipper used to make all the time, where it's just, you know, like you had to actually get good danger chances to actually beat them. Like it, it, it it's one of those where like the Flames are just getting really substandard goaltending overall and and i think right now we can say that that's the reason they're not where they want to be yeah and it's tough because like we've seen like over the last couple of weeks huberto's line really coming into its own uh with the addition of jacob peltier peltier is getting on the score sheet now huberto's scoring actual goals himself uh instead of just looking past and you know like things are looking up for the entire depth of the team and yet like the goaltending is just holding them back you know and i i don't want to let some of the other flames off the hook i mean you know there are issues throughout the lineup oh, yeah, I mean, I agree. andrew Mangiapane should be having a better year than he is stuff like that but i think that the goaltending is the one thing that like i think you know guys like Mangiapane who aren't having a good year are being augmented by other guys but I yeah. feel like the goaltending is definitely the biggest weakness right now. Yeah, it's like... A, and the thing that is costing them games. How would you say? It's like, this is a problem for, like, Manjapane, right? Like, that's a problem. Not, you know, like, the car's on fire and, you know, the engine just exploded. That's the goaltending problem. <laughs> you know, like, it, it's... You have to deal with the car on fire first. And then you can go to the secondary things. And, like, even uh, Manjapane, even though he's not scoring as much, uh, he his line has been extremely effective defensively and at generating scoring chances. So it, it's one of those where, like, yeah, it would be I- more ideal if he had, like, eight or ten more goals himself. But I think he's hit probably three times that number of posts this year. So it's just tough. Like, it's one of those where it's just everything just seems to be screwed up enough where it's resulting in Flames losses. And, you know, it's tough. Like, and, this and, whole you know, season's I always been try to, on this, on this show, I always try to sit down and look at are we being too hard on somebody or one set of players? And are we being too hard on the goalies? But And I think this week was especially bad for the goalies, but... You know what? I, I think the stats are showing us that the Flames are having real goalie challenges this year. Yeah. Like, and it, you, you can have goaltenders that are just average or below average, and that that's fine. Like, you know, like Riddick, uh, towards the end of his time here, was just an average goalie, and that was fine. It, it's There's a metric, the huge metric difference between being fine and you know like being down like 30 points in the save percentage from everybody else which that's where the flames are at like you know as you said earlier like an 847 save percentage since the all-star break like that's you know emergency backup goaltender level numbers not you know like actual nhl goalies level well, I mean, you know, we may see Wolf brought up, but right now that's not the move the Flames have been making. And based on the fact that we've seen some of the young players maybe not getting the shake that some people think they should, I don't know if that's going to happen. But uh, Daryl Sutter did say after the Vegas game that his strategy with the goaltenders right now is win and you're in. Um, do you think that's the right way to handle this right now? Anything to get them going. Like, really, uh, you know, like, uh, as, like, the Flames are quickly running out of uh, runway here to salvage the season so if you can get somebody to buy luck or happenstance to get on a roll great but yeah uh, the runway is so coming quite close to the end right now markstrom was in against colorado and lost that means it's if if daryl follows his strategy for even a week that means vladar's net in boston yeah or against boston sorry in, yeah. in calgary against boston yeah and um, yeah. Well, the other thing that uh, is coming up and maybe a way for the Flames to solve their problems is the NHL trade deadline. 
And we're less than a week from trade deadline. Trade deadline's on a Friday this week, or this year. I can't remember the last time it's been on a Friday. It feels like it's midweek, Monday or Tuesday. Um, let's let's look at the trade deadline a little bit differently. Matt, you're talking about a goalie issue. The Flames solved their problem by trading for a goalie. Usually there's not uh, too many goalies of note available no. at the trade deadline. and the ones that are cost quite a bit. Yeah. I don't think they're going to do that. No, and realistically, like unless you're getting like mediocre filler guy, and frankly, mediocre filler guy is a huge improvement um, for like a fifth round pick. Like say Yaroslav Halak, or you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you want that guy if someone's available on waivers shortly after the deadline. Yeah. Well, um, so I think- you uh, can't uh, add the guy to the playoff roster if it's not before the trade deadline. So. Yeah, yeah. I I guess it depends if we're worried about a playoff roster, but yeah, I I know what you're saying. Um, okay, so yeah, maybe you you go out and and move for a fifth rounder, but I think at that point, if you're gonna move for a goalie, you might as well try Wolf. Yeah, and that's or even or even Dansk or Chechelev. Like, it, you know, try somebody. Yeah, like at this point, like what's the worst that Dansk or Chechelev could do? Oh, an eight seventy save percentage. Guess what? You fit right in. You yeah. Know, like, <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to the club. Yeah. So I, I think it's probably fair to say the Flames are not going to take a big swing at bringing in an acquisition. Brad or uh, yeah, Brad, Brad Tree Living has always said that his team will guide his deadline philosophy. And if you listen to a couple interviews he's done over the last couple weeks, it doesn't sound like he's ready to make that move. Um, and also, we're, we're seeing a lot of talk that 2023 might be one of the best and deepest draft classes in a generation. So I And even if you look at the deals the Flames have done with Monaghan, with Kachuk, they did everything they could to make sure there was no condition or no movement of that 2023 pick. They, they might it be, you know, have their hands tied in the future when it comes to moving first because of it, but they really went out of their way, I think, to make sure they had their first round pick this year. Do you think it's safe to say that at this point, that first is not going to be in play? Oh, for sure. Like, unless you're getting gifted a star player for that pick, um, where it's like a deal you can't refuse, then sure. But, but I, I don't see any of those guys really left on the board. No. And, uh, I yeah, I don't see that either. Um, frankly... Tree Living has only ever moved his first for players with term. Yeah. So, you know, even by that, I, I've, I've said before, I really don't think the Flames take on term this deadline. No. Or and, at least not top player term. We'll talk about something I could see in a little bit. Yeah, it's one of those where, like, for the Flames... If they're going to make picks uh, or trades w- involving their own picks, like it, it has to be like getting Dougie Hamilton, like a young upcoming star caliber defenseman or forward uh, who's just worn out their welcome for whatever reason at their, you know, sort of like when they got him for a first and two seconds. Um where you can already pencil that guy in the top four. And that was not done at the deadline either. No. And I don't see any of that happening right now. No, I think if that if that uh, trade gets made, that's something that happens on the draft floor. If the Flames decide to make that move, but I think with the deep draft they have, they're going to want to retain or pick up even as many possible uh, twenty twenty three picks as they can. I agree, especially in the top rounds, which is not something that they've had a lot of in the last little bit. So. Um, I think, you know, that's going to be a top priority for this team. And if you listen to uh, an interview that was done recently, I don't have the source in front of me, but from Brad Treliving, he's quoted as saying, where we're at now, you've got to be careful putting first and second round picks for UFAs, in my opinion, said Brad Treliving. So that kind of tells me he has no plan to move his first or maybe his second this year. I don't think you're going to get value for that if you're the Flames based on where the Flames are at right now. Um but Matt, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about what the Flames will do. I don't think the Flames will do nothing. I think the Flames will do something. And Tree is crafty enough that I think he'll do something. Let me throw out a couple scenarios for you. 
Um, it was re- reported recently on uh, by Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman that the Boston Bruins were looking to incentivize another team to take on the contract of Craig Smith. Now, Craig Smith, I wouldn't say, is a bad player. He's a right-handed shot. He's kind of what the Flames want in a forward. How would you feel with where the Flames are at in the standing right now if the Flames took on a contract like a Craig Smith uh, and just they got our, a pick for their troubles? Just for our listeners, is Craig Smith a uh, free agent to be, or is there a term? Craig Smith is currently making uh, $3.1 million, um, and he is... It looks like a UFA at the end of the year. Well, and in a situation like that where the guy is done at the end of the year, definitely. And might as well use the, that cap space. Because the Flames have about $4 million to play with at the trade deadline uh, worth of cap equivalent. So, you know, like they could take on a Craig Smith or, you know, insert miscellaneous player here. Um, and if they can get like a fourth or better for that, great. Oh, it looks like Craig Smith actually just got traded to Washington. Well, that works. So he's off the board. Um, he was part of the Orloff trade. So it was uh, Orloff and Garnet Hathaway to Boston for him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a player like that, like if you can take on a guy, you know, we've got about three and a half million dollars to play with at the deadline. The Flames have just over, we'll call it 3.4 million. So if you can take on a guy like that who's not a boat anchor, who's not, you know, going to tank you, but a guy who, you know what, he's a serviceable NHLer, I think the Flames are at the position where they have to look at a deal like that. Oh, yeah. No, and the Flames are, because they've backed themselves into this weird position, like, they're, they're going to have to get creative in order to maximize the trade deadline. And... Uh, you know, uh, it becomes uh, improving the organization, not necessarily the team, and getting additional draft picks or whatever. Um, and I think that's the way they've got to look at it. Last year, they looked at that season. Yeah. Bringing in, you know, Yarn Croak, bringing into Foley. This year, I think you've got to look at the long term of the organization. Yeah. And it, it's one of those where. Like, it's a lot... This team's in a lot different position. Like, if uh, you're looking at this team, say, a year from now, where you have guys like Toffoli, Backlund, Lindholm set to be UFA, uh, like, the Flames probably move all three of those guys for a boatload. Um, And, you know... And I could even see one of those getting done at the deadline. Or, sorry, not the deadline, the, uh, the draft. Yeah. And it's one of those where, you know, it it's kind of both fortunate and unfortunate that uh, the timing of the struggles, like if it, this happened next year, like this team would just tear it right down and go into a full-on rebuild because, like, there's no sense at that point because, uh, like, the goaltending's bad, the team's kind of in that middle zone, you know, get what you can and do try to rebuild on the fly and you know with there being a uh, term on all three of those guys you're not going to get the return that you're looking for and 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 yeah i don't think you're blowing up your core this year but i think you've got to look at whatever you can do in small ways to to build for the future with the flames right now yeah, like I could definitely see them moving Lucic. I could definitely see them moving Brett Ritchie. I could see them moving Trevor Lewis. Um, because, you know, if... Yeah, honestly, and, and those if you, will get you mid-round picks. You know, and honestly, you know, getting three-fourths, say, for those three guys, you know, Zahorna, Dewar, and insert, you know, like Rajitska into the lineup, you know, on the fourth line, that'll do just as effective, frankly, as those three guys so you know like you're just getting free assets at that point and you know carry on how would you feel if the flames got creative didn't necessarily add a player but they acted as a broker sort of like we saw with minnesota in this o'reilly deal so for those that don't know in the o'reilly from st louis toronto deal minnesota absorbed 25 percent of riley's uh contract in exchange for a fourth round pick how would you feel the flames i mean we're hearing that uh you know 
Kane is all but done to New York. They're just trying to make the cap work. So what if what if Patrick Kane were a Calgary Flame for a few seconds, and you know we absorb say three million of that contract and send him on his way to Toronto? Um, you know, would how would you feel about the Flames doing something like that where we don't get a tangible benefit this year, but we're again building for the future? Well, and that's where Tree has to get creative and try to get as much. Like and like we'll see like over the next few weeks too and you look at like the NCAA uh, seasons coming to an end soon you know try and target whatever prospects there Matt Coronado is the big one yeah well uh, I'm just talking like college UFAs not uh, our draft oh, picks okay. but you know um, and you know like anything that you can do frankly at this point to get more youth into the team because there does seem to be a gap like once you get past Peltier, uh, Zari, uh, Phillips to an extent and uh, Coronado like there seems to be a quite the wide gulf between those guys and everybody else Mm -hmm. and so like this team's going to need more of an infusion in talent over the next couple of years and how do you say as frustrating as it is if the Flames were to miss the playoffs this year you know the, them getting a top 15 player like the the guy who goes say 14th overall in a normal year would be going like seventh or eighth so and i think that's important to remember too that if the flames do end up uh not in the playoffs that is gonna end up being a lottery pick yeah and like you could end up getting a guy that's a larger version of matthew coronado because coronado is a little on the small side um, but in terms of talent and, you know, like we've seen teams like, uh, like how the Sharks a, a long time ago got Logan Couture with like the eighth overall draft pick and, you know, like the flames, like this draft being so deep that, you know, like if they're picking say 13th or 14th, like they could get a guy that's of that kind of a caliber at that You pick. can move out what? 10 point, 10 picks now, which how many picks can you move up maximum in the in the lottery uh, 10. these days? Ten. So even if the Flames had the fifteenth pick, they could conceivably draft anywhere from five to fifteen. Yeah, and yeah, actually you can go back a few too. So let's go five to eighteen. Well, no, you can't. Uh, it's only open to the lottery teams. So oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So it would depend if anyone's uh, ahead of us or not. Like where we, f- there could be one or two teams behind us. Yeah, but that'd be a weird where, like, all the bad teams won the lottery. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you know, if we were to move up 10 picks, that that becomes even more valuable, that number five or number six pick, if we could jump into the top 10, which is not out of the realm of possibility in a deep draft. I think you've definitely got to keep that. And I think if the Flames can act as a broker for, you know, a deal like, an O'Re- like the O'Reilly deal, I'm thinking the Patrick Kane deal specifically because it looks like they're trying to find some money there. Um, I would say go ahead and do it as long as you're getting enough for it. I think I was kind of confused by how little Minnesota got for that. I think if you're going to do that, you've got to get more than Minnesota did. Yeah, uh, I know. It's like uh, here's uh, like a million dollars or so, like actual money just for a fourth round draft pick. It seems like a lot of uh, dollar currency for and I have a feeling that that trade, I mean, it got done early, so maybe there wasn't that need for it. But I bet as you get close to the draft, you could probably command more for being that broker. True. Right? Because teams are going to be filling up. I mean, you know, we just saw the Timo Meyer deal happen. Um, you know, there's a lot of deals that are happening these days. Um, and we're, we're seeing stuff. Uh, it looks like a Cal foot for. Uh, Cal foot deal just happened. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of, of guys moving. And so we're seeing a lot of money being eaten. And I think because of that, you're really going to start to see, um, you know, brokers in demand. Yeah. Uh, Tampa just basically said, yeah, we're, we're good with the draft. Uh, they traded a first, a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth for uh, Tanner Janot, which... I have, yeah. I well, the the first is conditional; it's top ten restricted, which I don't think they need to worry about. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the sec- a second next year, a, a third this year, a fourth this year, a fifth this year. So, Tanner Janot is obviously the guy that's going to take him to the promised land for a couple of years at eight hundred thousand. Yep. I actually do like Tanner Janot, so I do think that's actually a good price for 
Uh, yeah, I don't know if I would. I don't know if he's worth all your picks. Like a first, a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth. Yeah. It, well, um, he's basically the same type of guy that Coleman or um, Barkley Goudreau was. So, you know, that definitely fits for Tampa. And you know, Tampa's kind of in the we're in it until everybody's done. Sort of like Chicago and L.A. Uh, those kind of teams. So. You know, they might as well sacrifice what you can and try to win another cup. So, yeah, I think that that's something that we could definitely see the Flames doing. And, you know, at this point, I know that Living likes to go out and get his depth defenseman. I don't even know if that's the move I would make this year. Like, I think we've got no, uh, Gilbert. Gilbert we... has played well. And Connor Mackey is, and Stone are both viable number sevens behind Gilbert. I, I don't really see a need right now. Yeah, I mean, Stone is on the IR right now, so he's he's probably not the guy that we're going to look at there. But even if we look at some of the other call-ups that the Flames have made on defense for one or two games, like I think, you know, again, based on where the Flames are at, I think, you know, Nick Maloche um, is feasible there. I think, like you said, Mackie feasible there. I don't know that moving an asset to get another depth defenseman moves the needle enough for the Flames to give up that asset. No, and frankly, like, the whole team outside of the goaltenders have been performing well of late and kind of coming into their own since the start of 2023. And, um, like, having Peltier come in and cement himself as a second-line winger uh, basically is the trade deadline acquisition for a second-line winger that the team needed. And, you know, like, the depth guys have been playing good enough like walker dewar has emerged as a good quality fourth line player which that's like your depth forward trade acquisition you know and gilbert same thing like he's playing a very responsible third pairing to be right at the moment and that's what you need uh so you know if they can get the goaltending sorted out then everything's great i think the flames are going to take on let's call them NHL bodies and not um, prospects, I think they've got to be doing it to get something for that. I don't think they can be giving, you know, futures for NHL bodies, but if you can do something like the uh, the Smith deal we talked about where someone's willing to pay you to take that deal, as, as long as only for this year, maybe even next year, depending on the size of it, sure, let's do that. Let's grab that asset. Yeah, because why not at that point? And, and and if the Flames are going to acquire bodies, I wouldn't be surprised if you see them try to acquire some guys for an AHL run. Yeah, I agree. And those might even come, I mean, you know, those could be, I think those at this point, because the Flames are going to want to give up many assets, would be future considerations deals. And I'm using air quotes for those listening uh, via audio because we know that never turns out to be anything. But I think the Flames might be able to go to a team and say, hey, you got to shed a million bucks. We'll take so-and-so knowing that, you know, they're probably going to end up on the American League roster. Yeah. Even if they stay here for a couple of weeks or till the end of the season, they're probably being brought in for uh, for AHL depth. And we've seen some teams. I mean, Stevie Y has done this before. When his AHL team was good, he's gone out and made either AHL trades, like a forward for a defenseman or trading a couple guys around, or gone out and acquired for that AHL run. So I could totally see that happening with the Flames this year. Yeah, I agree. And why not? Like, especially if they decide to leave Wolf down on the farm and just kind of let the team be in the hands of Markstrom and Vladar, um, it would make entire sense to let that team try to actually win the championship because, you know, that will help uh, Wolf with his confidence heading into next year where he could potentially make the team out of camp. Yeah. And that again, I wouldn't want to give up. Um, I wouldn't want to give up futures for that run necessarily. But I think that there's guys. I mean, I'm even looking at a guy like a Lucic, you know, a, a veteran guy who's maybe on his last legs in the league that you might be able to bring in to put down there to, you know, v- bring some veteran help to the American League or even to the American League dressing room. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's sort of like uh, years ago when uh, Mike Keane used to be shifted around uh, to be like the captain of whichever team was going for the Calder Cup. That's a, that's a good analogy, yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, I think overall, when we look back at, or I guess when we look back at this next week, I think we're going to say it was probably the most uneventful Flames trade deadline in a long time. But I think it also should be. And I think it deserves to be with where the team's at now. Yeah. Like, frankly, moving Lucic was probably going to be the biggest trade. Uh, I would be, frankly, shocked if anybody bigger than that, uh, like a Backlund or a Lindholm or a Toffoli got moved. Um, and I don't see them going out and acquiring a goaltender or anything like that. It's just going to be a, you know, let the team do what it's doing and hopefully they figure it out or we get a better draft pick. and. So I, I would say of the names that you pointed out, Lucic is probably the one that's worth the most. I don't think you get very much for Richie. I don't think you get much for, for Lewis. What do you think the team could get for uh, for Milan Lucic? Probably a third. This year, probably not? Uh, third at some point. I, I think that the Flames don't really care if it's this year or not. Um, <clears throat> just because of the fact that uh, generally, like even in a good draft, uh, the talent pool tends to dry up at about 45, regardless if it's a good draft or a bad draft. And then after that, it's basically the same thing. So, you know, a third rounder is a third rounder is a third rounder. So if teams are like overly hung up on, oh, well, we don't want to trade a pick this year, but they'll give you the same pick next year. It's like, okay, sure. Why not? Because you're getting yeah. the, the asset that you're wanting, which is the third. So yeah, I think I think that's fair, and I, I think the Flames have also shown that they can do good things with with uh, mid round picks as well. Yeah, well, look at Jeremy Poirier; he's being very impressive thus far uh, on the Flames farm team, and is one of the best uh, defensemen in the entire AHL. And, you know, he was profiling to be a first-rounder the year that he was drafted, but fell to the third when the Flames got him. And, you know, he's looking like the defensive issues he had are not really that big a deal. And, you know, the Flames might have a really good def- NHL defenseman on their hand just for a third-round pick. Guy, I think pick. still needs some AHL time? Oh, I agree. Uh, I, 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 the soonest I would expect him to be up here would be by the time he's like 23 so you know uh, yeah pretty much what, like the tj years? brody timeline give or take i think that's fair for sure well matt uh, i think that pretty much wraps up looking at the week that was for the flames and talking about the deadline you yeah. always like to look ahead at the week or at the month that's coming up so as we're ready to flip the page from february to march we have one more game in february that's on tuesday against the uh, boston bruins here in the dome and then we have the rest of the March schedule. The Calgary Flames play the majority of their games at home this month. Uh, Toronto, Minnesota, Anaheim, Dallas, San Jose, Vegas, L.A., and Ottawa at home. And they'll be on the road for two back-to-backs. Dallas and Minnesota is the first one on the 6th, 7th. 20th and 21st, we have L.A. and Anaheim. And then they also have an Arizona-Vegas road trip in the middle of the month. So uh, how do you look at this month as a whole? Uh, the flame season will be decided by March 7th uh, if they do not turn it around. Um, so that's four games from now. Five. Uh, the Boston game, too. Oh, oh, you're saying by the end of the 7th. Okay. Yeah. Like, if they, they do yeah, not... Yeah, five. They do not reasonably do well over the next uh, week and a bit, um, you can pack it in at that point. Like, it, And you've got some pretty high powered teams coming to town i mean boston yeah. toronto even minnesota dallas like those are the teams that we're playing between now and then those are those are good teams yeah like frankly the flames rest of their schedule after that they have a couple against dallas a couple against or one against dallas i mean uh two against la and one against winnipeg in april and like everything else is like the mediocre bad teams. And when I looked at this schedule before the season started, I thought this is the month they'll be practicing for the playoffs. Yeah, and like realistically, the Flames need to win both the games against Minnesota and hopefully get two wins out of the other three games. But you know, like uh, honestly, uh, you know, I think them getting five points out of the five games would probably be the best that you could hope for and you know i don't see 
Like, with the current goaltending tandem, I do not see the Flames coming out of the seventh being even, you know, having a pulse at all. I, I think that the team, if they keep growing with the, those two guys, that the team's done. And, you know, you can pack it in. Yeah, the Flames are running out of time to do anything here. Um, and I think, like you said, we've, you know, we've used, okay, January, February being an easy schedule as a maybe uh, confidence booster for us and for the fans. And now we're past that. And this is a month that's it's, it's going to be a hard month for the Flames. Yeah. Like, you look at um, in the standings, right? Uh, you have Boston and Toronto, who are two of the four best teams in the East. Um, but then. The Dallas uh, game, like, Dallas has 74 points, Minnesota has 72, and uh, the other games against Vegas, like, they have 76 points, LA has 74, like, you know, like, all of those teams are basically very equivalently right there, and with each other, and, like, there are no easy games amongst those, and... Like, Calgary needs to be on the top of their game. And, you know, like this week, they needed to show it. And they walked out of the week with one win, just like they did the week before, just like they they did the week before. And, you know, like, you can't win one out of three games. Like, literally, that's what they did all of February. One out of three, or one game per week where they actually got a win. And... You know, like, it's just not feasible if you're wanting to make the playoffs. Like, you know, it's bad. (laughs) For sure it's bad. Um... You know, like, they need to, like, the time to mess around is over now. And you have to be in playoff mode if you actually want to make the playoffs. And, you know, like, it's kind of in desperation mode. And, like, if the team doesn't start to show that level of desperation like pronto you know like they're already four points out of a playoff spot and it doesn't take much more to april's a fairly easy month but by that point if you're if you're not in in a playoff spot this is such a tight western conference i think you're out yeah like realistically unless you're within two points of a playoff spot heading into april uh, even then knowing these guys they're not gonna do it if they're two points out oh no uh, uh well, how would you say that? They have not shown at any point this year that they can elevate their game as a team. Like, the the, the players, I think, have been better than what the goaltending has allowed them. But, like, For as sure. a group, you know, they haven't been able to take that next step. And, like, you see them explode, like, in the Arizona game or the Buffalo game where... You know, they just let everything fly and they run over teams, but they can't have that consistently. And it's just, you know, like this team, it's just so frustrating because, like, I've never seen a team be that good and that bad at the same time in such a bizarre way. (laughs) You know, like, you're an elite defensive team who gives up all these goals that are really bad, and it's like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, Matt, let's focus in on the first part of that month, and that's yeah. this week. The Calgary Flames have one game left in the month of February, which is going to be on the 28th. The Boston Bruins come to town. And then the Flames will have uh, the rest of their week at home as well when they will play host to the uh, to the toronto maple leafs on tuesday and then saturday night the minnesota wild come here with an 8 p.m start time so the flames will play one more game before the deadline they play the toronto game after the deadline what are your what's your prediction for this week zero points i didn't want to be that negative so i said you know what i think well we if we're gonna win one we're gonna win it against minnesota is what i said yeah uh honestly i think they drop all five (laughs) and yeah the season's done on march 7th so. so when you're saying all five, you're saying all five games until the seventh. Yep. Okay. I think you could even extend that to the twelfth against Ottawa, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Um, and if it's if we are going with what Daryl Sutter said, which is winning, you're in. That means that 
Dan Vladar should be in on the 28th. Yep. And we'll see what happens from there. Yeah. Well, Matt, hopefully we get better goaltending. Hopefully our goalies can get their numbers in the nines this week. And um, you and I can have something a little better to talk about after next week. Maybe maybe you and I will be excited we got a fourth-round pick. Yeah. Well, then we can discuss how good Kenny Augustino's doing. There you go. <laughs> or we can look at other fourth-round picks and how well they're doing. Yep. Um, or we maybe we can interview Mr. Pick and oh, okay. see how he feels about joining the Flames. I want out of this establishment right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's good thing it's good thing they can't do an Adam Fox and demand a trade if they're a fourth. Yep. <laughs> Just looking at all the all the weird conditions that came down today in some of these trades, we'll see if the Flames can get a fourth uh, outright or if there's going to be some condition on it. Well, honestly, Treleving's not trying if he can't beat his own Monaghan condition list. So, you know. If I have a ham sandwich nine times between now and the draft, it's a fourth this year. If not, it moves over to next year. Yeah, something absurd. You know, like right. If I'm not wearing blue and white striped socks, then, you know, it becomes a third... <laughs> <laughs> if we don't open three more Boston Pizza franchises this year, we roll it over to next year. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, Matt, uh, I will talk to you next week. Have a good one. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.